recording. So I didn't say much to to begin. Just uh, well, welcome Thomas. Welcome back, virtually. Uh, very very happy to hear your talk. Talk. This is the last one in our in our series for this uh, for this academic year. So uh, please go ahead. Okay. So, so thank you very much for having me. As, as Ferenc just said, so I have a history with Montreal. I was a, a postdoc there from 2013, 2015. So I'm very happy about the invitation to, to return, well, at least virtually to the seminar and, and to meet again, Ferenc, John, Marco, and Michel, many people that I, I, I remember and <laughs> know very well. Um, so, um, what I have in mind is the following. First of all, if there's any questions along the way, I think it's best to unmute oneself because I, I cannot guarantee that I, I always follow the, the written chat. Um, so what I have in mind is the following. I will uh, present you with some well, well recent results on, on, on the statistical behavior essentially of a quantum many body system. So it, we will talk about momenta spacing distributions in, in certain oscillators, anharmonic oscillators in particular. Um, this is recent work that appeared on the archive in January this year, and it is uh, joined with, with another former uh, CRM guy, uh, Mattia Cafasso, who's in, now in Angers, um, and his uh, PhD student, Sofia Tarikone. Um, now, if you look up that paper here, um, on the archive, you will quickly realize this is quite technical. And um, I think those technicalities are a bit misplaced for a mathematical physics seminar. So what I have in mind is that I will present you with the motivation, the background for this study. I will um, um, formulate, of course, precisely the results that we have obtained, but I will say little about the techniques. Um, that are used or the techniques that we develop to obtain those results. Okay, um, so to get started, as I said, this will be a, um, something about statistical analysis of a quantum many body system, more precisely a, a gas of non-interacting fermionic uh, particles that can only interact via Pauli exclusion principle and which are confined to some trap. So that's why the name anharmonic oscillator that will appear frequently. And the overall idea was to, to analyze certain quantities in this particle system and explore their relation to integrable systems theory. All right. Now, to be more concrete, to be much more concrete, so our starting point is the standard one-dimensional Schrödinger operator uh, here on the real line. Um, I use the variable Q to indicate uh, positions. So coordinate representation is here in place because later on there will be the variable P uh, which will be reserved for the momenta representation. All right, now here this is your starting point. So one dimensional here, you got your unharmonic potential. So even monomial and uh, indexed by a natural number, small n. The, the most classical example is the quadratic choice. So small n equal to one, that would be your harmonic oscillator. Right now, but to make things um, rigorous, to make things to the point, so this is an unbounded operator as a differential operator. So, by Hellinger Tuplet's theorem, it cannot be defined on all of the Hilbert space L2R. You need to specify some dense subspace on which the operator acts, right? These, these are standard considerations in the theory of unbounded operators. Now for us, that domain, that dense subspace will be the, well, smooth functions uh, with compact support, all right? Now on this domain, um, that operator is closable and its closure will be denoted by the bar on top. And that closure is a self-adjoint operator or put equivalently, the original operator is what we call essentially self-adjoint. Okay, now with this um, general setup in place, now the abstract theory kicks in. We are guaranteed existence of an orthonormal system. Those will be those uh, small size indexed by natural numbers. Those are square integrable functions, and um, that system consists of eigenfunctions of the closed Hamiltonian HQ bar. Right, here's the eigenvector eigenvalue equation. Again, coming back 
to the harmonic oscillator, small n equal to one. By the way, notice here, I, I'm never indexing my wave functions also with the small n because there will be lots of indices floating around. So we always have to keep in the back of our minds that these wave functions, they depend, of course, on the small n, which is the degree of your potential, right? Um, if you are, again, for n equals to one, then those wave functions are, well, Hermit polynomials multiplied by Gaussian one hums. So this, this is standard um, uh, um, harmonic oscillator wave function and the, the corresponding- Sorry, Thomas. Sorry, Thomas. Uh, I thought you're defining it on the space of compact support. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, but the, the, the closed one, yes, the closure, the closure thereof. Okay, so you're not you're not now dealing with the self adjoint operator. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's right. I just I just wanted to to build the the, the bridge to. The harmonic oscillator will play um, an important role in all of this because that's like the only example where things that I'm about to say have actually been proven rigorously. So I, I want to emphasize this point throughout, right? And as I was saying, so for the harmonic oscillator um, um, example, your eigenvalues that I haven't said yet, those are the integers shifted by one over two. So as k goes to infinity, uh, they will creep up to plus infinity, which will be important. And this is a general fact, not just about the harmonic oscillator, okay? Now, uh, I said I will be interested in modeling a quantum many-body system, more precisely a quantum gas consisting of uh, fermions. So how do we do this? Well, there's a system symmetrization postulate in quantum mechanics that says the locations Q sub K of those capital N identical non-interacting fermions um, at zero temperature confined to our unharmonic trap V. Those are distributed according to a, well, biorthogonal point ensemble, okay? So that, that's heavy talk here. It just means to say that the locations of those identical non-interacting fermions at zero temperature, um, they form a determinantal point process, okay? That is to say there's an underlying joint probability density function, which I write here in equation number three. Now in three, I'm cheating a little bit because of course at zero temperature, the most likely state of your quantum many body system is the ground state, right? So in the ground state that would correspond to one particular choice here of this wave vector k, namely the ki are just the integer i, right? That's the ground state, all right? But it will be convenient to have this general k here in place for what I'm about to do, namely I will want to model this um, quantum gas, not just at zero temperature, but at positive temperature. And then I need to average over those wave numbers. That's why I built them into my notation right now. Um, to build a bridge, of course, to, to topics that many people know very well. Um, if you are in the ground state, so if ki is equal uh, to just i, then if you look at equation number three here at this joint PDF, that's exactly the joint PDF that you also know from random matrix theory. Right. If you multiply those two determinants together, you get the standard formula for, say, Gaussian unitary ensemble, if you choose the harmonic oscillator again. All right. So there's a clear connection to uh, tem zero temperature setup and random matrix theory um, setup. All right. Now, but I will be foremost interested in positive temperature, and then this connection is more or less lost. So how to build up to the positive temperature setup? Well, this will be useful to have some abbreviations here in place. So as you can see up here, these are products of two determinants, right? Here the star is the complex conjugate, by the way. These are nevertheless products of two determinants, so it will be useful to abbreviate, well, these determinants with a capital um, psi. Um, and I, well, I split up the, the normalization sort of equally, right? That's why one over square root n factorial, all right? Now this is a, in itself a famous object um, because this is the standard anti-symmetric n coordinate wave function, all right? So this is an eigenfunction of the uh, superimposed Hamiltonian, um, this one here. Now you take the closures and add them up, capital M times, and this wave function in itself describes an eigenstate of the fermionic gas with this energy, where you add up the individual 
um, eigenvalues energy levels indexed by those wave numbers k sub i. Okay, now having this notation in place, so this will be key to many things, this capital Psi, which is written down here. Now having that in place, now what happens at finite positive temperature to those eigenstates? Well, this is known. Um, and you can look up into a quantum mechanics book. There it happens that all such eigenstates that I just described, those with the capital Psi, they occur according to Boltzmann-Gibbs law, right? So that means in turn that the joint probability density function that I showed you earlier, the one that gives rise to, to a determinantal point process, that one gets generalized to object written here in equation number four. All right, so you take your n-coordinate wave functions, you take the complex modulus square thereof, you weight it with the e to the minus beta lambda k. Remember those lambda k's, uh, when the wave numbers go to infinity, they go to plus infinity. And then you have to average over all those, well, wave numbers and the way it is indicated. Okay, there's a normalization constant out front, which is the typical partition function to ensure that this is a bona fide probability density. Okay, in turn, this means that the partition function is this expression down here. Um, one thing I, I also want to say, which I didn't on the last slide, is if you go back to this formula, I said that in the ground state, of course, the Ki's are equal to i, but for general k, this formula number three, it really incorporates the Pauli exclusion principle. So the fact that two identical fermions cannot occupy the same quantum state um, simultaneously. And that's simply because if they would occupy it simultaneously, then you would have some repeated um, um, wave numbers there and then your density would be zero. So the likelihood for that to happen would simply be zero. Okay, so that's Pauli. In a sense, it's encoded in this uh, chain of inequalities. All right, good. Now moving ahead, we are now at this point. So we have our uh, quantum many body system, capital N identical fermions can only interact through Pauli uh, interact, um, exclusion principle and that are trapped in my uh, well, potential. Okay. So this is the starting point, this is your PDF. Now, unfortunately, this PDF does not give rise to a um, determinantal point process. That's probably a known fact. So the question is now, how can you analyze fine structure properties, nevertheless, of your particle system, right? Can you, uh, I mean, you can write down the correlation functions. Can you, can you say anything meaningful about them? Can you study large end limits? Can you analyze gap probabilities? The typical stuff that you do in random matrix theory, but there is much easier because you have determinantal point process structure. So what happens here? What happens in number four? Well, as it turns out, some things you can still do rather explicitly uh, for finite n. So for instance, if you're interested in likelihoods that certain measurable sets A are empty, that is to say that they don't contain any of your capital N particles, and you can still compute this in, in somewhat determinantal form, right? If you are in random matrix theory, such a quantity, a gap probability would just be a Fretholm determinant you know, of some operator constructed out of orthogonal polynomials. Now here, it is still some Fretholm determinant, but it's much more complicated because that object that depends on, well, variable z, you have to integrate over some contour in the complex plane. Okay, nevertheless, this is an exact formula. Uh, the function capital F, this is all explicit, everything known explicitly, but it's irrelevant to what I'm about to say, so I don't show you the formula. What is relevant is though the structure of this kernel here. <clears throat> so this is a kernel of an integral operator. Well, this is the operator in itself, which has kernel that is written down there. So it depends on Z, that's the guy that you integrate over here, some small loop around the origin. And then this kernel um, in X and Y is, well, it involves those wave functions, right? Those orthonormal um, uh, wave functions that I had earlier, but here, this is an infinite series. This is a big difference to the random matrix theory set up there. This would just be a Christopher Dabu. Um, kernel, so it would be finite and, and you could, you know, sum it up in, in, in a certain way. But here you have to run all the way to infinity and then that whole thing is still weighted uh, with some Fermi factor here out front. Okay, that, Sorry, that, Thomas, yeah. I have a question, but this F, okay, I understand it's not relevant, but 
Um, does, is it locally analytic near the origin? Um, <laughs> I, I don't remember by heart. At all, so. so I mean, because otherwise, because it seems that this formula picks up uh, basically only a few residues coming from K. So it, it's or, not that simple. Let, let's no, put it okay. there. It, it's not that simple, unfortunately. Um, the, there's problem from this F, and then there's big problem from that red term determinant. But that, that I'm about to say, by the way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good. Right, so you have this kind of structure. So now, if you wish to analyze, you know, uh, fine structure properties of your point process, right? So that gap probability there, for instance. Now, as you do, how do you do this in random matrix theory? Well, you you study scaling limits, there is a global scaling regime and there's a local scaling regime, right? And then similar things you might want to do here, uh, but now the problem comes to the point where you at some point you will have to study asymptotic analysis. You will have to carry out an asymptotic analysis of this kernel, right? Just as you do it in random matrix theory when you have the Christoffel Dabu kernel, you localize it and then study asymptotics of orthogonal polynomials. And that localization is very important because it breaks down the entire sum into just essentially two terms, right? So now here, in general, this is not possible at all. However, there is a miracle happening when small n is equal to one. So when small n is equal to one, and these guys are your Hamid polynomials times those Gaussian one hums, then you can actually evaluate that um, infinite series there in closed form because there's Mailer's formula. Mailer's formula will break down that entire series into just compact expression. And that's one of the reasons why everything that I'm about to say now has only been proven rigorously for small n equal to one, AKA the harmonic oscillator. Beyond that, although there is some knowledge about these guys, so for instance, in the sextic uh, oscillator, these psi's, uh, those are Hoyn functions. So there is some knowledge, but there's no Mailer formula for Hoyn functions, at least that I know of. So that is kind of a big obstacle to proving anything beyond small n equal to one. Okay. But what do we want to prove? Well, one of the big quantities that especially theoretical physicists have been after over the past five years are extreme values of your um, point process, right? So very much like for uh, random matrices, if you're interested in fluctuations of largest eigenvalues, if you are in a Hermitian ensemble, here you can look at the largest um, coordinate, that Q max M. Now, this has some uh, good reason why people are interested in this. So first of all, I want to say that in the theoretical physics community, these four names that I'm about to write down, so David Dean, Pierre de Salle, Majum Dar, and Greg Scher, so the French connection, uh, they have been very much interested in, in, in this problem since 2016. And the reason was simply coming from experimental physics. Because in experimental physics, you might know that nowadays these imaging experiments for cold atoms, they are so advanced that you can actually probe um, positions of individual gas particles. So in other words, if you wanna fine tune your apparatus to the level that you can really, you know, pinpoint those locations, of course, you need a precise spatial description for your gas. And that's one of the reasons why people are interested in the extreme values um, of the quantum many body system. Okay. Now, mathematically, and I already said this, this really boils down to the derivation of large n limit laws. All right. So what is known? Well, unfortunately, not much rigorously. Um, I will try to say what is known rigorously and what is sort of speculative. Um, so first off, on the global level, that's what you can, of course, also do in random matrix theory. Uh, you look at empirical spectral distribution of the matrix. Um, you have to rescale everything right in random matrix theory divided by square root of the size of the matrix. There are similar scalings in place here for our locations, for those QIs, although I'm, I'm very, you know, coy about those, I would just say the empirical spectral distribution once properly normalized as capital N tends to infinity, uh, it converts almost surely to a 
probability measure whose density is written here in the right hand side in the orange brackets. So it's explicitly expressed in terms of a Pauli logarithm and it involves the temperature in the form of beta, right? So beta is one over the temperature. Now this is a um, probability measure whose support is not compact, all right? That guy is supported on the entire real axis. However, in the zero temperature limit, that's when we should get back to random matrix theory statistics because of what I said earlier. So when T goes to zero, that is beta goes to plus infinity, that guy converges pointwise to the density of the Wigner semicircle. So that's how these two worlds connect in that case. Okay, that's the global regime. Now, if you are now looking at fine statistics, you're going to look at the local regime. So now two things, you can do two things, essentially. First of all, you can be very coarse, so you're not going to fine tune yourself. That is to say, you just send, you know, you scale your, your, your positions, you center and scale them with large um, uh, capital N, but you do not scale the temperature with capital N. So if beta, sorry, if beta is independent of capital N, in such scaling regimes, you will discover the standard kernels that you know from the Gaussian unitary ensemble. That there is some regime where you will have the sine kernel uh, limit and you will have another regime where you will have the airy kernel. Now, it gets more interesting if you are not so coarse, because when you fine tune, that is to say, you scale temperature in a very precise fashion with the large variable capital N, then you obtain new limiting kernels. And those are nowadays called the finite temperature equivalents of sine and airy kernels. Now here, I will be interested foremost in extreme values, so I will only focus on finite temperature airy kernel. All right, here's one, a limit theorem, that's actually the only one which has been proven rigorously uh, last year uh, by Lichty and Wang in 2020. Dong Wang also has a history of CRM, by the way. Um, so what is proven? Here's the following. So you uh, look at this rescaled quantity, which is, by the way, the exact same centering and rescaling that you do when you study fluctuations of the largest eigenvalue in the GUE. It's the exact same centering and rescaling. But you scale temperature with, well, capital N to the one third, all right? This is only proven rigorously for the harmonic oscillator. So small n is equal to one, fixed. And here, well, this proportionality constant alpha is just a fixed number. Okay, then as capital N goes to infinity, Lichty and Wang rigorously computed that limit. Um, it is, well, a function of t, of course, so this is pointwise in t for any t in ordinary real line. The limit is indexed by the parameter alpha, and I use here this subscript 1 um, not to indicate any connection to Gaussian orthogonal ensembles or some symmetric, real symmetric random matrices, but to highlight that this result really only holds here for the harmonic oscillator. That is that uh, subscript here. All right. Now, what is known about this limit? Well, actually everything, so explicit formulas are known that F1 alpha is a Fretholm determinant. Um, that's great. Um, of an integral operator whose kernel is written here. All right. So you take two area functions, one here, one there, and then you multiply them by the weight, which is a Fermi factor, which is written down here. So e to the alpha z divided by one plus e to the alpha z. Now note, you can now play around with alpha. Remember alpha is positive. So what happens when alpha goes to plus infinity? Okay, little exercise. So when z is positive, then you will converge to one, right? And if z is negative, then you will converge to zero. At z equal uh, to zero, you were at one over two, right? So this one, okay? Um, so what does this mean in turn for the kernel up there? Well, you apply dominated convergence theorem. That means in turn, when alpha goes to plus infinity, this kernel will converge to the standard airy kernel, right? The airy kernel is just the integral where you have here zero to infinity and the weight is equal to one, right? That's the standard airy kernel. Yeah. But here in general for general finite positive alpha, it is the kernel in blue, okay? That's what we call the finite temperature area kernel. Okay, now 
let's go to the integral systems world. As you know, for this orange stuff, for the airy kernel, there's a very famous connection between the fraton determinant of the airy kernel and Poin Levy function theory, right? This is this connection is now uh, how many years old? 30, almost 30 years old. Okay, this is Tracy Widom formula. Um, it's a very natural question to ask if any kind of Tracy Widom formula would also apply to this more general setup where alpha is positive and finite. Right? And the answer is yes. There is a generalization of Tracy Widom formula to this setup. Um, maybe, excuse me, before I say that, here in my notes, I, 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 wanna, I wanna say something about the history. So this kernel was not discovered by Lichty and Wang. That kernel was in the literature already before. The first time it occurred was actually in 2007, uh, Kurt Johansson's work, but on a, on a very different subject. Um, so Johansson's work on the uh, MNS model. So the Moshe Neuberger Shapiro model. That's a very uh, peculiar random matrix theory model. Um, um, exactly solvable, though not the terminal model. And there he computed again extreme value statistics in certain thermodynamic limits. And he also discovered uh, that a finite temperature area kernel. That's the first time it occurred. Now, the second time it occurred is probably much more famous. It was in 2011. This is Amir, Corvin, and Castell. So they wrote their famous paper about the KPC scaling um, conjecture for KPC equation in itself. And they are also in the description of their limit theorem that finite temperature airy kernel um, occurred. So Lichty and Wang, they came much later. But they were in the context of this uh, quantum gas that I'm foremost focusing on. That, that's why I first mentioned these guys. All right, so now I said the natural question is what is the relation of that Fraton determinant of this finite temperature area kernel to Poin Levy function theory, if there is any relation? And the answer is there is. And this was um, first figured out by uh, Amir, Corbin, and Castell. This was their result in 2011. Johansson didn't, didn't write this. So here's the formula the F1, which is Fraton determinant of this operator up here is just exponential. Uh, then S minus T, as you know it from Tracy Widom distribution. But then here's some peculiar term, which involves a function that depends on two variables, S and X. So S is the variable that survives in that you integrate out in the last step. And in the step before that, you have to integrate out the second variable X against, well, the derivative of this Fermi factor up there. All right. Notice, by the way, now here's some dirty analysis. If you take this orange stuff up here and you look at the derivative, well, then you are certainly sort of maybe believing that that derivative would, you know, in, in some large limits. So this is very dirty here. So that when alpha is equal to infinity, maybe it's not so dirty. Uh, that this will be delta uh, function, right? And that's true, you can make this rigorous. And if this guy here is the delta function, this weight, then this integral, of course, completely localizes. And then it's out, and then you really have standard Tracy with a formula, more or less. Well, I haven't told you yet what this thing is, right? But that satisfies a certain integral differential version of the ordinary Poin Levy 2 equation. It's written here. How precisely it solves is a distinguished, it's not just any solution, it's a distinguished solution distinguished by uh, boundary condition. All right, so here's the equation. It is differential in S, as you can see here, second order derivative on the left, and the auxiliary variable again occurs here. And in this form, you have a total integral over u squared against this um, uh, derivative of the weight function. Again, if this were Dirac delta at uh, zero, uh, then the integral goes out and you get precisely Poin Levé two with a shifted variable. Okay, so in that sense, on this level, the connection is much more clear between uh, this one up here and the ordinary Tracy Widom formula for Poin Levé two. Now, there are some properties in place that also you have for the ordinary Poin Levé two function, Hastings and Cloud solution, namely some smoothness, real valuedness, and, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. All right, so this was proven by Amir, Corbin, and, and Castell. 
Um, at present, I've only talked about um, the F1, so small n equal to one, that is to say the harmonic oscillator. However, and now it becomes very speculative, although these are great problems, but I have no idea how to solve them. The physicists, of course, believe, again, Dean, Le Desal, Majunda, and Ger, that this is nothing so special here about n equals to one. In fact, they believe they have some evidence based on some local density approximations and functional methods. They have some evidence that in fact, this limit law here, this one that Lichty and Wang proved rigorously only for small n equal to one, <coughs> excuse me, that this also holds true for general n after appropriate centering and scaling. Okay, but what they expect is that the right hand side in the large n limit, even for general small n will always be the same. Okay, so there's some sort of universality conjecture in place, but to this day, this is completely open. Nothing has been proven rigorously here. All right, so now we'll make a switch now. So I've talked now a lot about these coordinate representations, but the title of my talk is about momenta distributions. So we will switch. We go from coordinates to momenta now of our fermionic quantum many body system. And there, as it turns out, although it's also not proven rigorously, um, things are believed to be highly small n dependent. Okay, to be more precise. Let's look at the Hamiltonian now in um, momentum representation. So, you know, just go into Fourier space. Okay. The operator uh, transforms to this thing, which is written here, and now I index it with P for momentum. All right. Now, while the average coordinate density, so this is just you take your PDF, you integrate out everything except for the first variable. So this is kind of like the one point correlation function thereof. But it is expected that this density always vanishes square root like near its extreme value in all unharmonic, even monomial traps, right? This intimately ties to this universality conjecture up here, right? Um, the same is not expected to hold true for the maximum momentum, okay? In fact, there, the average momentum density, which you can, well, compute sort of non-rigorously by using Wigner's quasi-PDF, that the Wigner quasi-PDF is sort of a joint PDF for, for coordinates and, and momenta, and, and these guys, those would be marginals of, of, of the Wigner um, um, quasi-PDF. Um, it is expected that the behavior of the average momentum density around its maximum value is highly independent. Okay, and we don't, we do not expect that this will always vanish.
it's a composition of two additive Hunkel operators, right? That kernel, that is the more precise statement, that kernel is the composition kernel of two additive Hunkel operators uh, on the real line, right? And that, that structure actually is quite, quite useful to have. All right. So now with this in place, now the very natural question, of course, is earlier I showed you Amir Corbin Castell formula for small n equal to one. The question would be, can you derive anything of that type for general small n, aka for the Fretholm determinant of this operator would be general higher order area functions in place. Um, um, I know in the audience, people work on, on, on tau functions and on, on lots of hierarchies. Of course, you can imagine that you include here some intermediate terms that, because those tau functions they always depend on some times, you can do something similar here. Of course, you can um, introduce all those, uh, you know, intermediate odd powers of y and you can decorate them with some times here. What I want to say is this, the results that we derived in the in the paper, they are for tau k is equal to zero, so the simplest case, but nevertheless, you can lift this with you know, sufficient algebraic uh, power uh, to, to, to general uh, times tau k, all right? Uh, before I show you the results, I wanna make one comment also there about universality. So now we saw here the right-hand side, well, it depends on small n, but could there be anything universal hidden in the limit six? Well, there the expectation, again, this is only an expectation, is that this limit uh, six, although n dependent, is expected to be universal across a larger class of smooth confining potentials that have a single global minimum, right? For us, it's at the origin um, that um, grows sufficiently fast um, when you go off to infinity and locally look like this, right? That's at least the expectation. Again, nothing is proven there uh, rigorously. All right, so now the question I wanna answer, the one that we answered in the paper is, Integrable system connection Tracy Witham type formula. What generalizes the Amir Corbin Castell formula with the integral P2 uh, to this uh, more general setup with the higher order area function? Okay, so now what we did is we put ourselves in, into a <clears throat> slightly broader uh, uh, context because the techniques that, that we use, they, they work uh, quite well also in other contexts. So, uh, so far in this coming from the physics, coming from the quantum gas, my weight function was always this um, uh, Fermi, uh, uh, Dirac, Fermi Dirac distribution, right? This, this is, by the way, a distribution function, uh, right? So, but that there's, uh, you, you don't have to be that, you know, particular when you're just interested in integrable systems connection here, as I say, the analysis that we carried out um, works for, well, a more general class strictly increasing differentiable weight functions, although even that is not the best possible outcome. You, your weight function could level off at some point, so it only has to be non-decreasing, but then the analysis becomes uh, more technical. I, I think I, I will show you why. And also the differentiability is not really needed. You could have, as long as you have different derivatives almost everywhere that are integrable, that, that would still work fine. What is more crucial are these limiting behaviors here, because we are interested in a, in a determinant, Fretholm determinant, and uh, Fretholm determinant might have zeros, right? And, and that, that connects again to the tau function business that many people are interested in Montreal. So when that, that thing happens, then, then something weird happens on the level of the integrable system. So you don't want this to happen. And this is essentially encoded in these two boundary conditions. Uh, this constraint here, this is for um, ease of analysis. So the you, you creep up to the limiting values exponentially fast. Um, a a power-like approach would be sufficient, but it makes the analysis again um, harder than, than it has to be. Now, in this general setup, we're gonna study fraton determinants of these integral operators, where you have the products uh, of two higher order area functions down here, and now this general weight here um, in the, to the right. Okay. Um, by the way, Fretholm determinant here, of course, is well defined. This is, um, it has to do with the asymptotic properties of the higher order area function that you can easily derive by classical techniques. And you can prove that this is indeed trace class on, on, on that space. So Fretholm determinant is well defined. In fact, this object here, which is even more general, we, we include here a 
generating function parameter lambda here out front that could be complex, could be complex, phi term determinant nevertheless is well defined. Um, and it depends on T, that T is in the kernel. And it also of course depends on N because the higher order area functions in the kernel depends on N. Okay. Now here's the result. So this is uh, very compact because I sweep the, the nasty parts under the rug. So you have following result. As long as um, your generating function parameter in complex modulus is at most one, so inside the closed unit disk, then you have again this general formula. This is, by the way, a, a consequence of this fact that I said earlier that you look at operators whose kernel are composition of Hankel um, uh, operators. Whenever you have this, you will automatically land on this structure. Okay, it is a general algebraic fact. It doesn't use any analysis. But what uses analysis is, of course, what is the dynamical system for this guy, right? So, because that's important. Um, well, we proved that this, um, again, a function of two variables, uh, I don't indicate the N and lambda dependency up there because of, there's already so many variables, but it sits in here. Um, it is a unique solution of a boundary value problem. Here is the equation, and here is the boundary condition that selects the distinguished uh, solution. Now, of course, all the magic is sitting in this um, um, product here. So these operators L plus U and L minus U that are uh, raised to the power uh, N. Well, those are certain integral differential Leonard recursion operators. You can find the explicit formulas in, in, in the paper with Mattia and uh, Sophia. So in other words, for each N, for each small n, you have um, its own equation. So in other words, this is a hierarchy of integral differential um, Poinlevy type equations. Um, even better, I will show you some examples, even better when you do this, well, dirty business that you look at uh, w alpha x, e to the alpha x, one plus e to the alpha x, and you send alpha to plus infinity, this here, well, converges in some sense to the standard, um, the ordinary Leonard differential uh, recursion operators that you use to define the ordinary Poinlevy 2 hierarchy. So in that sense, this is really a generalization, a lift of ordinary Poinlevy 2 hierarchy to the integral differential uh, setting. Okay, And this was certainly not known uh, before our work, how to suitably define those hierarchies. Okay, uh, Here's some examples. Um, I, I use some, you have to use some compact notations, otherwise this, this gets really messy. So the compact notation is here the following. So you have this sort of, it's not an inner product, it's a bilinear form, say. So you have functions that depend on these two variables, s and x. You integrate out the second uh, one with respect to w prime, and then you go out as a function of s, right? So now here's the first member. Here's the first member. And this is just the Amir Corvin Castell integral Poinlevy 2 formula. Again, if W prime of X is Dirac delta at zero, this just becomes the ordinary product of two functions. And then you get your two U times U squared, so U cubed. That is ordinary Poinlevy 2. If you do N equals to two, okay, so of course it has to get already uh, messy, uh, but nevertheless, if you do the same trickery here, so dirty trickery, then this reproduces precisely the second member of the ordinary Poinlevy 2 hierarchy. Okay, so this is aligns beautifully. Now, it has also been known for more than 40 years that, of course, the Poinlevy equations, or at least some of them, those are just just um, scaling reductions of some more general PDE equations, right? So for instance, for Poinlevy 2, um, this is a um, scaling reduction of, of MKDV equation. And, and that statement also works for the full hierarchy. So to get Poinlevy 2 hierarchy, you can start with MKDV hierarchy and then do some uh, reduction and, and you get there. So here now the natural question would be, does something similar work in this integral differential um, uh, setup? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. So what we did in the paper after defining, well, this as the integral differential Poinlevy 2 hierarchy, we also defined a suitable integral differential MKDV hierarchy, okay, MKDV hierarchy, and then showed that via an explicit scaling reduction, you go from MKDV to this integral differential Poinlevy 2 uh, hierarchy, right? So that, that, that's, that's nice. So things align there. Now, 
I will say only a little bit about the methodology because there it gets really, uh, well, I would say technical, all right? So methodology, well, first off, Earlier, I showed you the higher order area functions defined as this highly oscillatory integral over the real line. Now, of course, that um, you can easily then uh, lift to contour integral formula on the complex plane, but you got to be a bit careful here, right? Because the higher order area function, I haven't said this yet, but probably it's clear, it satisfies a higher order um, uh, differential equation, right? So here the order is 2n, right? Uh, this here, this minus one to the n plus one, there's this always confusion in the literature. So here we use the convention of the physicists, which build that into their, you know, uh, definition of the higher order area function. There's other papers out there uh, which don't uh, use this, and then you're always confused when you try to align, um, you know, the results, right? So minus becomes plus and plus becomes minus. Anyways, now with this formula, of course, you got to be a bit careful here because this equation has lots of solutions for, uh, for, for small n. So the precise solution that you have to select, that is hidden here in the choice of the integration contour, of course. Right? Um, good. Now, once you have this, what you can do in principle, by playing around with this differential equation, you can go back to the kernel. So remember the kernel looked, well, roughly like this. So there were these two higher order area functions, x plus t plus z, and then a n say z plus t plus y, and you integrate out that wz. Okay, now you can go in there, um, integrate by parts, and then a bunch of times exploiting this orange box, you can bring it to this level, which is written down there. Okay, this is a super easy computation when you just do this with the ordinary area function. But if you do this for general small n, you will pick up lots and lots of terms here. As a physicist did that in their paper, so there's formulas for those fi's and gi's written down. They're all in terms of those higher order area functions and derivatives thereof and, and certain suitable combinations. Okay, that's possible. And here now, by the way, since you go for integration by part, you got the derivative again of the weight function appearing. Now look, if that derivative is just um, Dirac delta or a linear combination of Dirac delta, then of course the integral localizes. So this thing would go out. But for general weight functions, that thing is gonna survive and that causes trouble, right? Because if the integral is gone, then you're dealing here with uh, very well-known uh, class of integral operators, which are the integrable integral operators, right? And integrable integral operators, um, they are nice because there's a tool back out there that allows you to analyze the underlying Fretholm determinant. In particular, there's a tool back that allows you to analyze the dynamical system and, and pull out these Poinlevé two or Poinlevé two hierarchy formulas. But now here, the big trouble that you face is, well, there's actually two troubles. The, the, the bigger one is this, that the integral is still there because now this guy is not of classical integrable type. And the second problem is that this small m here, well, this will depend on the small n, right? So that the higher the member here of the area function, the, the more terms you have there, all right? Um, now, nevertheless, what do we do about this? So those are some techniques I, I developed over the past two years. I've been playing around with, well, so-called operator value to uh, Riemann Hilbert problems, right? In this setup here, when you don't have the integral, what you face then is a problem of, you know, computing a certain matrix that has properties, right? And now once the integral is still present, then you are not searching anymore for a matrix, but you have to search for a suitable operator, all right? So an operator is actually an integral operator, Hilbert Schmidt integral operator, that thing has a kernel, and the properties, um, analyticity, asymptotic normalization, jump condition, they are built in into the kernel of that operator, right? So that, that's how operator value dream and Hilbert problem work. But to get to that point, you still have to overcome the second uh, difficulty here, this dependency on, 
on small n in the terms, right? Because the operator value problem, this will act on, on, on some direct sum of Hilbert spaces because you're looking for an integral operator. And uh, there's more terms in your sum, the larger the small n becomes, right? So this again becomes, gets very messy very quickly. So you wanna avoid this blowing up your dimension of, of, of those direct sums of Hilbert spaces, each one already being infinite dimensional. Uh, so what you do, well, then you go back to an, an old trick here that uh, Professor Bertola um, used uh, about 10 years ago, but now here in the integral differential setup. So in order to avoid this technical obstacle of, of having large sized operator value problems, you exploit the contour integral formula. The contour integral formula for the higher order area function, because this formula, which is still written here, it essentially says that the higher order area function is the Fourier transform of this e to the i lambda 2n plus 1 to the 2n plus 1, which is a very simple object, right? So in that you can exploit because you got to remember you're dealing with Fretholm determinants. So Fretholm determinants, they are defined in terms of operator traces and those traces, they are conjugation invariants under, under, under certain conjugations. So that's a gauge freedom you can exploit. And indeed that's what we did. Exploiting that gauge freedom, we are able to characterize our um, initial Fretholm determinant through an operator uh, two by two uh, valued uh, Riemann-Hilbert problem, but still operator valued, not matrix valued. So what does this mean? A two by two operator valued Riemann-Hilbert problem. Well, that's a problem of finding, I already said this, a Hilbert-Schmidt integral operator, uh, capital X, whose kernel depends on a spectral variable Z and the analyticity conditions, the, the jump conditions and the normalization conditions, they're all formulated in terms of conditions on that kernel, right? That operator acts on um, um, direct sum of two Hilbert spaces. That's the simplification that you get from using this conjugation invariance. Otherwise, if you don't have this, you got there lots and lots of terms in your direct sum and that makes the analysis very messy. But so it's, it's rather controllable. Okay, so a direct sum of two Hilbert spaces. Here, by the way, you have this, um, these are weighted Hilbert spaces, the sigma, uh, so the sigma here, I, I, I wrote it here, but maybe I didn't mention it, is this abbreviation here, okay? So, and here is one of the reasons why in my analysis, I don't like those weight functions that level off, that are sort of locally constant for a while, uh, because then these spaces are no longer Hilbert spaces, right? That, that's one of the reasons why. I like increasing weight functions and not just non-decreasing ones, okay? Good, now you have to set up this problem and then what you have to do is by first principles, you have to prove its unique solvability and that is achieved by writing down, well, formula for solution, right? So that, that formula um, is an integral operator whose kernel in, 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 uh, uses the resolvent of the, of the operator that you initially started with. Right. So, but then you prove this is uniquely solvable. Once you have it, then more or less you are good because then you can use Lux pair techniques. But here, the major difference is you're not doing compatibility conditions between two matrices, right? Zero curvature condition. No, you look at zero curvature conditions between um, operators, integral operators, right? So, um, and two by two operators. So there's another level of non-commutativity coming into the game because if you look at the matrices, of course, they don't commute. But if you look at entries, those entries, the scalar entries, they commute very well. But here, my scalar entries, they're operators themselves. So they don't commute in general. Right? So that, there's another issue that comes into the game and that involves quite a lot of algebra. Nevertheless, um, that Riemann-Hilbert problem, the Lux pair that you pull out, in turn, um, encodes the um, um, integral differential equation. So how does this go? Well, because the Lux pair, its entries, those are integral operators, Hilbert-Schmidt integral operators, so they have kernels again. And it is those kernels, which are functions, that are not operators, it is those kernels which satisfy the integral differential equation. Well, you have to look at the right one, of course, but you have to also find some integrals of motion, which are, which are now operator value equations. But but this works with, with, with sufficient trickery, you will find out the integral differential hierarchy.
Okay, so that's all I want to say about the techniques. Now, final comment about this. So earlier I said once that it is very important that you are dealing here with um, these um, kernels that are um, uh, compositions of two Hunkel operators. And in fact, the first important consequence that you get out of this is this formula, because this doesn't use at all uh, that you're dealing with higher order area functions. That computation that you have, this representation, is just a consequence of this Hunkel structure, of the Hunkel composition structure. So now you might ask, well, then where actually kicks the higher order area function in? Well, what I will say, just in words, there's more, if you're interested, although you guys are on a slightly different time zone, there's a conference next week here in Bristol, uh, uh, Professor Grava, uh, Snaith, uh, Metzatri, and Joseph Nashnudel, they're organizing a three-day meeting, and there I will speak for three hours about this stuff, uh, so if you, if you want to learn more about operator value lux pairs, you're most welcome to join. So what I wanted to say is, this. So where does the higher order area function kick in? Actually not in the existence of this Riemann-Hilbert characterization. Also this Riemann-Hilbert characterization only hinges onto the fact that you're studying compositions of additive Hunkel operators. The, the influence of the higher order area function, that only then kicks in when you're pulling out those Lux pairs, right? But the fact that this operator here, this one here, it's threat on determinant you can characterize through an operator valued Riemann Hilbert problem has nothing to do with having here these higher order area functions. You could put in here general phi's and psi's, well, under suitable assumptions, some regularity, of course, has to be in place, but not much. But you could put in here in principle general phi's and psi's, and I can still tell you what the underlying Riemann Hilbert, the operator valued. Riemann Hilbert problem for the Fretholm determinant should look like. Then, of course, after that step, if you um, want to pull out the Lux pair, then, of course, you have to use the precise form of the functions phi and psi, aka here those higher order area functions. Okay? But there's lots of, in other words, algebraic universality that floats around in, in the background, even for those much more challenging operator value Riemann Hilbert problems. Okay, um, that's all I wanted to say. There's in the chat, can you put in the chat a link to the Bristol workshop next week? I can, um, I will minimize my screen, I can actually show it. Um, yeah, there I will speak more about, about this stuff, but I, I will begin with matrix value problems for Hunkel composition operators before jumping to this operator value stuff, okay? So again, thank you very much guys for having me with you uh, this afternoon or for me now it's night. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Sure, there are questions. Yeah, uh, well, I have a few questions, but I don't know, maybe other people also want to. So, well, if not, let me ask. So, uh, mm -hmm. this result about um, this kind of integral differential lax pair, uh, sorry, Pallade uh, hierarchy, I, I think I missed it a little bit. But, so, it depends on the choice of W, right? Not just on the every function that they are in the kernel. It depends on which choice. I didn't hear the first word. Uh, uh, w, this um, this weight function. No. No. Uh, as oh, long it's, as it's... you are, as long as you are. Wait a second. I have to go back. As long as you are in. Oh, you're this saying this that the class, W. Okay. This class, it will still work. Oh, I see. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, but it, when you get this into the differential lat pair. Um, so then what was one? Ah, yes. So the there are two members, right? Two operators, uh, two operator values matrices, so to speak, two by two. Yeah. And one of them uh, satisfies an ODE in Z plane, in the spectral yeah. plane. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, the, other one, the other one in T, the well, which which is the this. other one in T. Okay. So the the, the Z. Uh, Differential equation is just uh, I, well, okay. So, right. So that now my question is the following, right? Um, now here, uh, so you have an operator valid uh, differential equation with yes. polynomial coefficient, I assume, right? Yes. I mean polynomial in Z. Yes. Yes. Right. So then there is a, a monodromy extended monodromy map. Stokes data and all yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. 
So then uh, that means essentially these, uh, in this particular example that you are working out, you have explicitly computed the uh, Stokes operator, quote unquote. Okay. All right. right. Um, how, um, do you, so the question is a little bit open-ended and it is, if you, um, because I'm, I'm interested in the case where, uh, so you, you are familiar probably with the work with Matia and, and Glodia Rupsov, where we had these non-commutative parallel, which okay. were really two by, uh, yeah, you can say that operator values, but the operators are matrices. Yeah. So it's yeah. really just bigger matrices. Yeah, yeah. But, sure. uh, but uh, in fact, the large pairs that we write down there, uh, they do not at all use almost never the fact that these blocks are matrices. They can be in an arbitrary non-commutative associative algebra. So okay. you, you may, the, the algebra works exactly as well in arbitrary, in infinite dimensions. Okay. And then uh, one could use the, um, the question is, so you, in the standard Panleve, you have, you know, the canonical coordinates P and Q. Yes. Let's say that uh, Q is the solution of Panleve 2 and P is uh, some, I forgot, some, the derivative of the Hamiltonian, but something like that. Uh, now, and these P and Q, they become matrices in that setting. Okay. But there is nothing that prevents you to, from considering uh, them as operators. You could impose yeah. that they are operators, uh, quantum operators that, that commutes to the identity. Okay. And uh, my, que my question, I have suspicion that something, th this work that you've done here is a little bit in that direction. And, and that's why I'm asking, because I don't know if there is a general theory of, um, you know, the extended monodromy map for operator value differential equations. Yeah, yeah, me, uh, I so, know either, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that, that's where uh, there are several things um, that I can only kind of guess by analogy, right? But because as you know, maybe you know that the Stokes manifold is also a Poisson manifold for, mm -hmm. for Panleve. Now, mm -hmm. this solution I suspect uh, corresponds if it is the strict analog of the standard uh, uh, Astin's MacLeod. Yes. I think it corresponds to a totally Lagrangian submanifold. So you don't see the Poisson, the Poisson structure there in the in the space of Stokes data, mm -hmm. in the space of Stokes parameters. Uh, so what, to see that one should really attack more generally the. Uh, the Stokes phenomenon for operator valued right, um, a differential equation. And uh, I don't know if you have probably, well, I guess I'm saying it a little bit for myself. I should look at you <laughs> more carefully what you've done because maybe there is an interesting angle in that direction. I think uh, that should be interesting to, to look at. I don't know if you have had any discussion with Mattia and Sophia in, uh, in that direction. Um, so when it comes to geometric, uh, that's more your angle right here, um, uh, to the geometric side of all of this. What I know is that for, because you mentioned symplectic manifolds and all of that. So I, I know for small n equals to one only uh, that the integral differential finally be two equation, but this is not an operator valued equation. This is ordinary scalar functional equation. Uh, this is a Hamiltonian dynamical system. Okay. So this, there's some Hamiltonian structure. Now, of course, one, one might think that this also generalizes to, to general n, but I, I don't know the details. I think Mattia wanted to ask Sophia to, to have a look at this stuff. Um, beyond this, coming back to your uh, uh, comments about general monodromy problem, <clears throat> this, of course, is just a special case of an integral. I mean, people tend to ask the question, you know, Let's go back. Where's the formula um, here? So, uh, you know, can you say anything about connection formulas for these integral differential mm -hmm. Levy transcendence and whatnot? And then, of course, my answer is always no. Um, uh, uh, what, what I can foresee is that using this operator valued language, I can set up really an analog of the ordinary six ray Levy 2 matrix yeah. problem for this guy. 
um, in the integral differential setup. Now, now how did the, uh, a big thing which is which I swept completely under the rug is how to do any asymptotics and how to do any meaningful asymptotics for these operator value problems. That that is a big big challenge that I've been working on now, now for, for already some time. Okay. Um, so it, it, you mentioned the <clears throat> six rays, right? For this solution, however, you are the what you have on four. Four for this are four, yes. But of course, it, it's right. clear then how to 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 introduce the last one with some you know cyclic constraint or some right. That, is that the constraint that is a little bit um, you know problematic uh, because now the Stokes parameter quote unquote they do not commute. They're they're Stokes operators. Yeah, and that yeah. and that's yeah. where a uh, little bit the. the the, the interesting thing comes in, right? They, they, they probably become some kind of quantized version of Stokes manifolds, but, oh, but yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's very it's interesting. interesting. From the geometric viewpoint, there's lots of open questions. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay, okay. So I, I, well, I don't have any more questions. Thanks for the excellent talk, Thomas, as usual. Thank you, Marco. So, uh, Maybe at this point we can just say thank, thank you again to Thomas. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, this is the uh, the last uh, talk in this in this uh, in this edition of the seminar. So see you see you all in uh, in uh, September. And I will quickly put this conference uh, link. Yes, please. Yeah, share with us the. Uh, so there's. Um... Mattia and Sophia, by the way, will also, I think Mattia and Sophia in that meeting, they will talk exactly about this stuff. I, I think Mattia will do this vector, uh, point level two stuff, and Sophia will do the integral differential, where I will talk more about this universal features with the Hunkel composition and how mm -hmm. to do that. So, Very good. Thanks again, and uh, have a good Thanks. summer, everyone, and see you in September. Yeah, enjoy the summer, everybody. Thank you. Near and far. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. Thomas. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye.